So oh. thanks for coming to join me uh, and uh, to be a part of this sort of closing session. This is, you know, we, we've been influenced along the way by um, our experiences through this week. And I was thinking about that and I was playing around with, I uh, put a question in the survey and we're going to have that at noon just to, to try to capture some of the experiences. This was a unique event. And uh, I was also thinking, you know, in my spare time, um, of going back and capturing a video log uh, of all of the things that happened through this week uh, and maybe some of the inside things. Uh, Thomas has talked about wanting to do, um, and we've talked about the October PSA day for BCEDL to actually be in mirroring this kind of a, an approach. Uh, and that talk has led to some action, which uh, I was really heartened to hear um, this morning as well, uh, to try to replicate this kind of a model. Because once you've got the infrastructure built in, you can add the face-to-face -face components easily, much more easily. You just have to have a place that you all decide you're gonna meet, and you just have to have a computer and a room with a screen that's large enough to, for everybody to see, to do sort of the, that kind of a session. So it's something to think about, and it's also what got me uh, in going as well, is to think about how we might wanna do that in April. Uh, if we find that we have a face-to-face -face, uh, -face component, uh, I'm gonna be excited by that. So to me, this is sort of the title of what it is, but I want to bring it and drive it back into, you know, the practice that you're experiencing, not the practices in my own experience here, but it's still leadership in and for. So we have to lead in digital learning spaces, but we also have to lead for others in digital learning spaces. So to me, it's really important because if we don't do it ourselves, we don't get the experience, then, you know, we learn by doing uh, really effectively, but we get ideas about what to do from each other. And I've got lots of other ideas and we've changed things along the way for these four days uh, as well. Uh, it's been a wonderful experience, which is why I said I think you want to capture it. But, but the, the, the other part is, you see the, the, the four P's that I've got there, or is it five P's? Sorry, I gotta get my screen off. No, the five W's, that's what it is, that's right. Um, so, so in terms of who, what, where, when, why. So that's an important part of what it is that we need to, to be aware of as we're doing and we're looking at this. So a um, couple of things, and I'm just gonna, one of the things that I, if you want to actually see people when we get in discussion, uh, you can actually, in your little window that shows up, you can actually turn it into a, um, a gallery view. So you can see more than just one person. Um, and I can sort of put it away and I can see others. Okay, so purpose, why are you doing it? Why are you using a digital learning space? What's the end outcome? And I go back to a lot of what I like is Wiggins and the T in terms of understanding by design. You begin with the end in mind. We hear a lot of this, you know, colloquialisms, it's really important, but it really is, I think about What's the net gain? The other part is the preparation. And we, we all know how difficult it is to prepare for everything. And as we learned on Monday and Tuesday, you're only as good as your backup. <laughs> and that's where Canvas is, uh, integration with Big Blue Button saved us. Plus a bunch of people jumping in with creating their own meeting room spaces and their own Zoom pieces. So we actually managed to salvage what went at, at uh, this time on Monday morning, I was actually defeated. And I said, it's, it's gone, we've ruined the whole thing. <laughs> and that, the, you know, again, the preparation was there, but it wasn't drilled through as much as we, as we needed to do, I needed to do, the team needed to do. So, where my motorcycle is going. You go, sorry, we're gonna triage over to Pam to go grab that one. Quick answer before it hangs up. I think that's, sorry, <laughs> personal stuff. Um, so, so the preparation is the toughest part in teaching online, but then also practicing. So, and we have to be prepared to make mistakes. So we made mistakes together. I made mistakes with you and you're still here. <laughs> so 
that's there. And then once you get all of that figured out, then it's like, okay, now how do we make this part of what we do as a regular basis? And Who teaches digitally fully online already, um, the biggest challenge for me is supporting families that are in crisis um, from a distance. Uh, a lot of them don't have their regular supports. We're finding SPED kids are really having difficulties. They've got uh, kids at home that normally aren't at home all the time. And uh, a lot of parents are kind of, uh, right now they're, if, they're, if their kids are alive at the end of the day, that's enough. And education is far down the list in terms of importance. So um, that's, that's my biggest challenge with my families. Hey, someone else. Sorry, I'm just buying some time here. <laughs> Gotta get somebody into a session. I, um, biggest challenges for um, me personally, I have a, a grandson who lives with us and so he's home full time right now and um, everyone in our house were super fortunate but we're all still working. So to try and juggle um, what we're going to do with this three-year-old who's used to going to daycare three, three days a week um, and still work. I keep having this feeling like even though this has happened, a lot of things are big face-to-face -face. end of year stuff has been canceled. So normally I would be full bore working on all of that stuff, but that's sort of off the plate. But I still feel like I'm running as fast as I can, even though some of it, just because it's, it's different, there's different things to worry about and supporting other people and, um, our teachers, some of our teachers that are in the same boat, they suddenly have kids that, that they don't normally have and they're normally resilient and, and not feeling so resilient right now. Can you just stop it? Just put it in the door. Oh, sorry, I didn't realize that I left. I'm still getting used to the technology. Um, uh, <laughs> I think that's been no my... Problem. <laughs> I just told my daughter something about laundry. I'm like, oh no, I forgot I was going to comment something. So I think the biggest learning curve for me has been just like uh, seeing how adaptable I am and making mistakes. And it does make me, um, I think, have more empathy for my kids who struggle. You know what I mean? Because as a teacher, you get set in your ways and you feel like, oh, I'm an expert. I know how to do this. But this is really like, oh, um, really made me see like how adaptable am I and how am I when um, things don't go as planned over and over again. Um, and I think also though that's uh, an issue I guess for my students or, and the parents I guess is learning to adapt to these changes. So some people are in a better place to do that than others and it's hard because you can't go to their home and help them. So I guess just sort of that, that helpless feeling I guess I'm also feeling mm -hmm. upset that I can't um, get as hands-on as, as I would be able to. So. Yeah, it, it, it really is. It's very, very different, um, you know, and, and I, I call it almost to the point of being weird in terms of how this, how you, we're looking at things. Um, anyone else feeling like, like disconnected? Yeah, I don't feel much different. It's funny because I usually work from home. And our teachers work, a lot of our teachers work from home, so that part of it is not. So we've actually had more Zoom meetings because of this than we normally do. But, um, it, and people assumed that we would have a lot of them because we weren't all in the same building. And so even our admin in the district were like, oh, well, I guess you're used to this. And I'm like, no, not really. <laughs> <laughs> There's, there was a there was a visual that I, I picked up that that I think kind of says it all to to me for a lot of the pieces around this and uh, come on. There we go. so so it, I mean, they're, they're ghosts really you know in terms of how that's there they're kind of real but they're not it's kind of like when you look at the gallery view here in terms of where are, are is anybody really there. You know, now Michael's there because I see that, okay, in terms of the screen. But some of you have a profile picture, so it gives it a little bit of a sense of connection. Um, you know, and, and then the other thing is, as I mentioned, talked about on, I think it was on Monday, I was going like, you know, what does your background say about you? 
So that was where I was playing around. Sorry, I get it this right. Uh, it's over. How can I do? Oh, there. Last week, I get it closer to the camera. The door. And I said, hmm, maybe that means I want to, like, I'm just waiting to get out. Uh, the other thing that was interesting that I learned about backgrounds, well, I'll go this way, is that picture over there is Tai Moon. And, but we used to have a mirror there. <laughs> it works really well in the house because it kind of gives you a bit more open space and view. Um, not so good when you get a camera shooting at it because anybody walking by, there's a, a someone shared a, a, a story about uh, someone was doing, you know, self-help makeup and everything else. And she went into her bathroom to do it and was not thinking at all. And her husband was naked showering and if people could see him showering right behind her. <laughs> so it's like, it's a different reality. Kids are ghosts. How do you build a connection? Um, and, you know, to, for me as adults, it was great. We could do this, the gallery view, but there were security issues when you try to do this in Zoom that the BC Ministry of Ed is going to take care of for K to 12. But it's really, your hands are so tied because we all started as those teachers that, you know, when back in the day, Alec was saying he was, he started teaching in, what did he say, 1995, 93 or something like that? And I'm going... Yeah, I, I'm going like, oh my God. I stopped being at a, a, a school in 1993. I started teaching in 1978. So it's, uh, but I remember being, using physical um, proximity uh, and presence to calm kids down in a classroom. You know, somebody that was really starting to get agitated and anxious, you just walk over and stand by them. I can't do that. <laughs> um, I used to do that uh, as well uh, for um, when I taught. I stopped being at the front. I feel like I'm at the front. You know, I just, I want to walk into Stephanie. I want to walk beside you and say, hey, what, how's it going? How's your environment? What? Oh, that's really cool. I like the way you set that up. But I can't really do that. The closest I got to that once was uh, playing around with, we used to do Moodle Moot with virtual as well as uh, physical in terms of the conference. And that's really, I'm hoping where we can land in April. But I, I, I was going like, all these people are online. And they're just seeing like, what, a talking head? How do we create a sort of a more personalized experience? You know, well, maybe what we do is we do something. And I just knocked my other machine out of the room. I was going to give you a different camera angle in terms of that. But I walked around with, with uh, my laptop that was plugged into Illuminate Live. This is many years ago. And just took the camera and says, hey, I'm walking down the food line. Look what we got for, for lunch. Look at this. It's awesome. Oh, look, there's so-and-so. And how do you do that? What are you doing to create and reach out? Is it jumping on a school bus and going by and honking and waving at kids? Or is it in a car with driving around? Or how, do you, how are you connecting in your kid's space, in the student space? Any, anybody got some thoughts on that? I definitely do. Um, I've been having, well, I've done this all year anyways, but I've had a real uh, larger group of students coming to my online classes. I do weekly online, I do Reader's Theater, I do Gamer's Club, I do novel studies and lit Thursdays and things like that. And I've had probably five or six more students. Like I've got, usually I get kind of 10 or 12. Now I had, I've had 20 in my classes this last couple of weeks. They seem to be kind of craving that connection. And uh, I do lots with Flipgrid. I have Padlet going. I have lots of sort of other things besides the synchronous sessions that I'm sort of you know, posting topics of the week and encouraging video responses and picture responses in sort of non-academic ways, just kind of connecting, connecting in personal ways, I guess. Randy, you're muted. And uh, were you talking to us or Pam? Yeah, you never know. I was muted. Thank you very much. I was busy. Michael just shared a screenshot of us in, in here. So thank you, Michael. Appreciate that. So maybe when you're here and I know you're going to be speaking at, at, at noon and stuff. Is there, do you have any thoughts uh, from, you know, your workings, uh, anything else about how do you build a presence? Anything that you're learning from, say, your Zoom experiences or other? Um, I don't know about learning. Um, yeah, I posted it in the chat because I was going to just take the picture and then screen share it, but I 
figured since it was your session, I shouldn't just grab the screen from you. Um, but um, you mentioned the term social presence, and I think it's actually kind of useful to, to go back and look at the, the, the research around it. Social presence is actually a, a theory that was developed back with telephone communications. It was coined by Short Williams and Christie back in 72. And it has two variables, immediacy and intimacy. Um, the immediacy is, is sort of uh, self-explanatory. You know, how immediate is the interaction that you have with the, the other individual? I think what we're all sort of dancing around here is that second variable, that sense of intimacy. You know, how do you project a presence that gives the other person the sense that you're a real person that actually cares about them and gives a damn whether or not they learn or not, or, you know, well, in our case, it's learn or not, because we're talking about students, you know, they were talking about telephone conversations. So they were talking about other aspects of, you know, that sort of empathetic expression. And I think that's where we're struggling. It's with that intimacy aspect. You know, how do we, you know, project that that sense of intimacy in a thing where as you saw from the screenshot there's you know half of my screen is basically you know just names black screens with names on them yeah, and and how do you know what's going on on that back end because you, you may not get the full picture people may not turn on their webcam privacy says maybe you shouldn't be having kids showing the insides of their house with parents and kids and other things going on you know, and what really is going on back there, you really don't know. So that's the other part of this, this whole this picture in terms of, you know, what is happening and what can we do professionally um, and ethically and legally in some cases? Anyone else have some thoughts on that? When I was doing, I just finished up my master's last year and studied engagement and motivation in distributed learning and looked specifically at our program. But a lot of the studies that I read said things as small as using their name in an email um, and then, of course, a phone call and Zoom and all those things are really important. And they were talking about a lot of those studies were um, college and university students uh, working with a teacher remotely. So they had no face-to-face -face contact at all. And those little things made a big difference in terms of the kids' um, they would stay in the course, finishing the course, and at the end feel that they did better in the course. Um, and I think for a lot of us who already have a face-to-face -face contact, just trust that you have that relationship already there, and, and then you can continue that on. And if you can, phone them or email them or, or Zoom with them, you feel like you've had a visit with them. Yeah, yeah, I'm going to pick on, because uh, I know, Martin, you're doing a lot of this, Geneva and Melissa as well, but we're going to also pick on Paul, who just dropped in, uh, to, Paul's new, he's uh, just became uh, taking over at Cool as principal, so I'm going to come to you last, but uh, Marty or, or Geneva or Melissa or um, anyone else, web webcam or not, you know, how do you build it intimacy? Well, for me, my assignment is a little bit different. I have, I have, I teach phys ed online at eBus, but then I also have a hockey academy locally of kids that I have, and and I'm trying to do a couple of skill things that I I did a Pecha Kucha for some skating things. I did a little YouTube video. Both my boys are home; they play hockey as well, so I can use them as demos. And I asked my kids, my academy kids, to try those things, and then send me some pictures of them doing what I'm asking them to do. Or I just ask them, hey, no need for pictures this time, but on the honor system and don't lie, just check off if you've done these things this week. So, and a lot of these kids, they, I see them around town because they're in town. So I, I do have that relationship. But other than that, it's, it's tough with kids that are a long way away. It is, it is, and I think that I think some of the text uh, chat going on there, I think, is is important. Uh, and uh, I didn't quite start that way with this session, um, but when I'm teaching, um, I always start with, "Hey, just do the check-ins." Uh, those of you that have gone through, I, I jumped in with a, the new cohort group uh, in uh, BIU's sessions, and Avi was doing the same thing. So he was going like, "Tell me one thing." 
what's happened in the past week or two weeks since they, they met. Uh, and, and it's just, it personalizes. Um, and, and that really builds a, a sense of community. I know that being a cohort um, with students, and I'm talking about adult learners here now, don't know how and if it can work the same with students, but having and building a sense of community within the students themselves is really, really strong. I know that in the physical space, uh, the last school I was in, we really focused on building a sense of student autonomy and community and leadership. And because of that, we were able to actually switch kind of the whole persona and culture within the school within a, a few years, because we handed the student, as I said, we handed the students the keys. And it was exemplified just beyond when there was a student protest going on and all the secondary schools in Nanaimo were gonna walk out and go downtown. Of course, I mean, it's kids, right? There's a cause, let's go walk out. And so I got a heads up from the school north of us because was, everything was south uh, from the admin there who said, our kids are walking out and they're coming to, to, to rouse your kids at Woodlands. So it was a bit of a, I don't know, probably about a, 15, 20 minute lead time for a walk. I went and grabbed all the student council uh, students and I said, you have my authority to go into every classroom and tell every student here what's happening. Ask them if they want to choose to demonstrate their concerns in a different fashion or join the walkout. And they all unanimously said, well, we'll follow your lead. We'll stay in this class. And then the student council kids, I told them to go, go to the doors, talk to the other kids from Wellington. They blocked everybody from coming in our school. And it, the headlines the next day in the newspaper said, uh, all high school students walked out downtown, Woodland students stayed in class and have sent these letters. And I thought, what better way to describe how you can do that? So to me, how do you build that remotely with those ghosts that are out there? If it's okay for me to jump in again, I know I've always been a very strong believer in uh, being uh, authentic and uh, genuine, genuine and personal with my students. Um, I, uh, I'm a bit of a science fiction fantasy geek. I love Harry Potter and Lord of the Rings and a lot of my students like, like those things too. And so I'll have V classes or online classes that we conduct that are just Harry Potter related. We had a Harry Potter earlier party in V class earlier this year and uh, it was totally just for fun but they've built a community amongst themselves there's probably about eight or nine ten students that that are always in in these classes together they've started to form connections with each other they they uh, they come to gamers club they play online games together when it's not school time um, and but they see that I'm invested in the things that I love and they love them too. And, and so we've built a strong connection with similar interests uh, that way that that's really genuine, I think. And, it, and it, they all feel accountable to each other and to me because we all kind of connect that way, so. Thanks. Um, Michael, you still there? Can you do me a favor? I got an emergency because there's a wrong link. So I'm gonna have to deal with that. Um, Michael, if you don't mind, can you just keep the conversation going? Sure, I'll see what I can do. What's the name of this session again, guys? Um, one of the things you've seen over in the chat here, I've been trying to work with Randy, is just throwing up little tips. And um, I see some people have been adding in them as I've been going through. Um, TN just posted one. One that I like to do quite frequently, um, especially when I was living in the Windsor area, uh, teaching at Wayne State, because there were a lot of Red Wings and Leafs fans there. Um, when I taught online, and this was eight years ago or so, so there, what we would do online was a little more limited. But when I do, you know, PowerPoints and stuff like that, I would always throw up any time that the, the Habs beat the Leafs or the Habs beat the Wings, that would just be a random slide in my slide deck that, you know, I'd go through. So I'd be talking about, you know, the three ways in which we can support online learners and, you know, for the design, the delivery and the support 
and all of a sudden the slide pops up with the score from last night with all of my guys, you know, and the, who got three goals and that kind of stuff. And um, even down here where it's not a hockey place, because I'm in California now, so um, whenever the, the Habs beat the Sharks, which doesn't happen very often, so I've had to start cheering for the Knights as my secondary team, who do beat the Sharks on a regular basis, um, that makes its way into my slide deck every single time. So I see a few more people posting in the chat, but feel free to grab the mic as well as we keep this going. I was going to say, I'm not sure if you can hear me. Yes, we can hear okay. you. Okay, that, um, you know, talking to some of the kids, um, I was, some of them were saying, yeah, we're having meetings with, um, with our teacher on Google Meet, and it's okay for a few minutes, but after that it gets kind of boring. And so what I've done, to try and get them to connect with each other because they're missing that connection with friends and just it's just to step back and say okay look this is not just me talking here you know whether you're using because i'm teaching languages but whether you're using french or or just english it doesn't matter just you know ask each other questions you know try and throw in those little bits of french that you know but so and i just step back sometimes and i just say okay just ask each other questions and i i think it helps them to connect with each other because they're missing that right the the timing thing i think is an interesting point because one of the things for everything you can say about the whole mooc experiment that they had year you know in the, in the last five years and and how little or a lot it changed education i'd say little uh, one of the things we did learn from it is that um there was a lot of research that went into what looks at effective videos and I mean, while we're in a synchronous session here, I mean, really, it is a, a video session. You know, if you're not actively participating and, and you know, there's a half a dozen of you that are actively participating, the rest of you are just viewing it the same way you view TV or that you'd view a YouTube video. We know from that research, that MOOC research, that at best, I've got your attention for 12 minutes. At worst, it could be five to eight you know, but yet we have students come into a Zoom session for 30 minutes or 60 minutes, and we don't break it up in the same way that we would these little instructional videos. And I think, um, you know, Florence's point is um, not just a useful one in terms of getting them interacting with each other, but the timing that she said, this is why I thought of it, because she said every eight to 10 minutes. And, you know, that's, what got me thinking along these lines, you know, in the classroom, we have these periodic pauses to do things and we also can walk around and, you know, that physical presence that's there keeps their attention, you know, unless I do, you know, the Randy thing where I walk around the house um, with, you know, my laptop in my hand. Um, there's not a, a physical sense. We're all just sat here um, some of us quite comfortably, some of us not so comfortably, um, and we're consuming this. So how do we take our synchronous sessions and, and break them up so that, you know, the kids are doing something every eight to ten minutes? You know, everyone get up and, you know, walk around the house for a bit. Everyone, you know... Um, I don't know. It's been a long time since I've taught kids, particularly and I never taught the young ones, which I think would probably be the fun ones to teach now because they'd actually do something like, you know, ridiculous like that. Clay Simon says, someone says in the chat, you know, little things that, I mean, you can just take even 30 to 60 seconds to do something like that and then do the same thing every 10 minutes. And, you know, then the next class you do something else and you set it up. So Mondays we do X and Tuesdays we do Y and, um, you know, but it, it gives them that break so that, you know, they, they don't have that cognitive overload from um, just watching the screen. And, and um, one of the things, dance party, yes, um, some Grey's Anatomy fans there I can see. My wife used to watch it all the time. And that was their thing. They'd have, you know, they'd dance it out. Um, not one thing that I would encourage in my classes, but that's just me and, and my own peculiarities. Other ideas? Just talking about timing, I've noticed for myself, like we all talk about wait time when we have our kids with us in classrooms, but online it's really hard in a Zoom class because like at the end of an hour I'm exhausted, which is 
a bit scary <laughs> thinking about going back into the classroom because that waiting for somebody to speak up and say something is sort of nerve wracking because you can't get all of those visual cues you normally get when the kids, you can see them sort of debating in their minds what to do or what to say, where's this, everything's still until somebody says something. So that's part of the timing piece too, I think there. I think it's still and dead silent. Like that's the harder part, at least in a classroom, you would have maybe some other ambient noise or whatever, that's something that is not sort of like, it's absolutely silent and you're dying, waiting for someone to speak. <laughs> Yeah, I find I have to turn my microphone off so I'm not tempted to jump in and fill in the void. I just have to wait. Yeah. While it's not good for the needing breaks part, um, one good strategy is if you have something, you know, because it essentially it forces you to close your mouth. Um, you know, so you ask a question and then you reach over, it takes, you know, eight, 10 seconds to actually grab it, get it up. You've got to swallow it and then, you know, make sure that, you know, that's not fizzy or nothing else is coming up afterwards, you know, so you're muted all that time. So that little bit of, you know, those little habits that we have, um, you know, can, we can use them to our advantages um, in this kind of environment. Yeah, I did my first presentation yesterday and I, that's what I actually found the hardest because no one had their pictures. They just either had their name or like a frozen photo. So it's like, I felt like I was a comedian, but I like, are they laughing? Are they crying? Are they like, what are they doing? I felt like I was bombing. And so I, I could tell I was like more nervous than I would normally be in front of a class. And I thought that's ironic. You'd think being in a group full of people um, would be worse, but I actually felt more nervous being in front of a screen because I couldn't read people and I was, my um, presentations are usually a little more organic. I kind of read the room and then like do a certain story or certain way and I, I couldn't do that. There was nothing for me to read on. So I was happy at the end that everyone said they really liked it. But yeah, not having that feedback, I didn't realize how important it was and how much of a, a winger I was when I present stuff. I mean, I know the material, but how um, I, I really do things depending on the group that's before me. So yeah, I have to, re like if I do another presentation, I have to reorient or maybe like check in more. But it was hard because at the beginning I'd said, hey everyone, like, you know, put on your screen, say hi, and it was silent. <laughs> and I know when, um, even for me, like at the beginning, I felt so um, nervous about seeing my face because I'm sort of um, not used to that even for myself, seeing it in the, in the Zoom meeting, feeling comfortable with my own face. So realizing that even for kids are going through the same thing about feeling like more exposed in some ways in this kind of format and then the ease at which you can hide right to like i'm like woohoo! i like just having my name up there and not my picture so but i'm trying to be out there today and put my picture up yeah i'm gonna stop rambling okay i'm back <laughs> I've tried everything to solve this problem technically. And the only thing I could do was put out what Brian sent me via sked. So hopefully they can get into Brian's, but he's in the, uh, he's doing a duly start part. So people have to go back and look at the recording anyway. So, so back to, to sort of the questions in terms of the leadership, just to bring it back. I appreciate the sharing and thanks for kicking in, Michael. I appreciate that very much. Um, so the question becomes one is in terms of, okay, so we know what, and we've got some ideas, but exactly how now would you, if you had to help your colleagues out, how would you help them to prepare? If we go to the practice side of things, how do you prepare teachers, but how do you prepare your students? So it's going back in terms of the pandemic. We're supposedly, now I can understand you know, we're in this situation, we've gotten used to that. Uh, parents are, you as parents are trying to deal with it. You've got some kind of a chaotic structure. It's been going for five weeks for the most part. Um, so the question is, oh, okay, we're going back, we get got special needs students and the, the, you know, urgent care people, the, the most that uh, are essential services, get them some respite so they can be doing what they're doing uh, and then have a little help. So, okay, that's gonna limp us through. Oh, we got a grade 12 students, we got to deal with something. Around. So to me, it's like, okay, so what happens in September? Because we're gonna get round two and wave number two of this virus, and therefore we're in some kind of a situation. So how do you prepare 
And how do you let them practice? Because right now, I think the essential, essential question is, what are we doing in terms of leadership now to get ready for that inevitability of September? I mean, hiding in the corner isn't going to help. <laughs> and, and as much as I wanted to walk away on Monday and just say, forget it, it's done, over, sorry guys, apologize, go back to work. There is no conference, so we'll just give you all your money back. And I thought, no, that's not a very good response. So now you're stuck, we're all stuck. What do we do now to get ready for September? <laughs> Thank you. Appreciate that. I, I think for me, because I every year at this time, I'm thinking about it anyways, and even more so now. Um, I think one of it would be just picking a few things at work and, and starting slowly and building around one or two, whether it's technologies or ideas and and growing out from there because it's so overwhelming. And even the last few days of doing all of this, I have lots of notes of things to come back to because we can't, there's a lot of great stuff out there, but we can't use it all. And if it's overwhelming for us to try and figure it out, imagine what it's like for the parents or the kids who are still learning to use Moodle or D2L or whatever the case may be. So start small and just grow it. Yeah, and, and that's the sort of the kind of do what you already know that you're successful at, and, you know, rely on your strengths moving forward first, but then as well, stretching beyond. But but how you guys have been triaging a lot of folks, I think Melissa, Melissa too. Um, what What's the advice that you start with teachers? It's just start with what you know, um, but how do you get them actually prepared for teaching because uh, in organizing effective online learning experiences? Um, again, starting with one thing. So, I mean, you can't take everything you do in the classroom and put it online. It's, it will never work quite that way. It's just a different organizational structure, but um, trying to make use of things like videos to record a lesson. So instead of trying to put all of that content in one way that's written and it's not what the kids would normally be doing to access information, try and keep it as similar to what you would do but of course you can't well you can put on performances I've seen people do all sorts of things that are really good to try and incorporate more of because I know we tend to use a lot of courses that are very text-based and that doesn't always work well so um, try and get some of your own personality in it and, and do things that work for you and that you're going to be able to follow because trying to find somebody follow somebody else's structure is really, really difficult or a course that somebody else has created is really difficult because you'll never be happy with what somebody else came up with completely. Yeah. I, I like Lauren, what you, what you'd indicated as well in terms of, you know, how do you, how do you unlearn things? How do you stop doing things? If we're going to take in, the capacity. I think that's the fundamental question for a lot of teachers. They're used to doing things in their ways. Then you, how do you encourage, support, cajole, have them stop doing worksheets? Because that's the first go-to that we know. And I remember when I first started teaching, and we're trained that way. I remember coming out of teacher school, whatever it was, it was an undergrad at, in uh, UBC. And you know, I had these supervisors that came to check me out. And the first thing they wanted to see was a lesson plan. And then when I started teaching in elementary, I had to have a preview and a lesson plan set. So I had to tell them what I'm going to structure that's going to happen. You know, as I got better at teaching and I had all these worksheets, I was like, I don't know whether you ever watched the seventies movie uh, teachers, Nick Nolte as the, as the, the drunk and then Richard, uh, what's his name? Um, I can't remember any, he was the guy that escaped from insane asylum. Richard uh, that, Pryor maybe? No, no, uh, the, yeah. the actor's name, it's a, it's a 70s movie. Look it up on YouTube uh, or, or in, I don't think it's on Netflix, but Teachers, it's hilarious. <laughs> they had Ditto, Ditto was the guy, but you yeah, may have had that teacher who handed out worksheets. These kids would come in, they would pick up the worksheet, the bell would go, they'd pick up the worksheet, they all sit down and they go blah, 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 like this, and he was sitting in the back with a paper. And then they just kept doing that. Then it, when Val went, they picked the, their worksheet up, put it in his inbox, and out the door they went. Well, there was one day, 
Uh, well, spoiler alert. I, I won't spoil alert. Anyway, but how do we get away from that comfort? It took me a couple of years before I got out of that as a classroom teacher. When I stopped and I looked, I was teaching earth science. And I, I was doing, and that back was back in the day of Gestetner. We didn't have photocopiers. So I would, we're doing a Gestetner run. I'm, I might as well print for next year. So I started printing for next year all these things that I would do. Yeah, Richard Mulligan, thank you, Geneva. That's, you're right, thank you. Oh, awesome, I love that. Um, so the, then I stopped and I looked and I went, what the hell are you doing? <laughs> you know, that's not engaging with students and it's earth science. Screw that, let's take them outside. And so I start, started to change and started to work with students. And then I started to get them to show and demonstrate and teach. And we had chaos. And then the principal came in and said, Labonte, there's too much damn noise in here. You're not teaching them, you know, because it's just chaos that's in here. What the hell's going on? So how do we get out of that? Anybody had similar experiences? Anyone went through the same transitions that I did? I think it's important to recognize that everybody, both teachers and students and um, parents, are dealing with like low level stress in the background. And um, as part of that to recognize that we might, as teachers, want to just go back to worksheets because that feels safe. Um, and that um, it's going to be hard to make changes. I think just even saying that helps people go, oh yeah, I am dealing with low level stress. I am like maybe a little touchy or wanting to do things traditional ways because you know, it's like, well, Trump, I want to make America great again. I want to go back to the way I think it was, but it's never going to be that. And to recognize that we are going to have to change. And then that's going to be difficult for people that might be control freaks. That might be a lot of teachers. So I think just like to acknowledge that sort of helps in the moving forward process. And then, um, uh, then also, I think it's what I find, I think I've become more informal, like, um, well, this is sort of funny. A friend who's a teacher, she was, uh, you know, getting used to the new platforms and by accident, she um, wanted to say uh, to her husband, uh, I'll be back in a minute. I just have to go to the bathroom. I have to poop. And she accidentally sent that to like a teacher. And she's like, oh my, oh my goodness. And it wasn't a teacher she was really um, close with. So it was super awkward. But just how, or like, you know, how like I talked to my daughter about laundry, like just we're an, uh, our lives are, are more incorporated um, because we are at home and to recognize that fact and that that's okay. And I think by us doing that, that sort of makes uh, parents and students feel a little better too, to see that we're having these difficulties and changes as well. Right. And then, um, yeah, and then I think um, doing like mindfulness stuff and like making sure that as teachers, we say that that's important for us and to encourage kids to do stuff to try to relax too, because that stress is always always on the back burner for all of us. To, to be human, mm -hmm. we, we, we don't have to perform. We just need to be human. But we have certain boundaries about how human we can be. Don't swear, <laughs> not a good role model, you know? Don't take your phone to the bathroom, okay? Not a good sound. <laughs> and it's so we have to have limits within that, but definitely being human is important. See, to me, there was something, and I just want to share this because it was, it, it kind of, when I saw this picture, I thought, oh my God, that's exactly how people must feel. Oh, hang on, I shared the wrong screen. <laughs> so you got to look, looking at what's going on in my life. There we go. So, emergency teaching to me was this. You're, you're tied and you want to scream, you can't get out, you don't know how to connect. It's just a terrible, terrible set of feelings. And what was interesting as well, there was a study that was done by, um, hang on, Education Week in the US. And this is what they found happened after the first couple of weeks. Serious issues. Okay, and, and earlier, the art's more difficult. Earlier, what we had uh, was people asking about, how do you teach art online? Okay, now, Mario Pochat, who has come and uh, does Vancouver for Animation School, but Fame, uh, they've actually got a setup to do online uh, art, uh, and they've refined that. And that's what we get with some of the folks that come to uh, as, as exhibitors uh, and stuff, that they do have a solution that maybe we can leverage off of, 
And I think there's a lot of that that's going on. But, but think about that, okay? The one that really got me was the consequences for work not completed. Seriously? <laughs> that's what you're worried about? Wow. So anyway, that's, that was, I thought, was uh, worth sharing. Can I just make a comment about your, how do we step away from worksheets? Um, I come from a position where I work for a DL school where all my kids are homeschooled. So we, this coronavirus didn't really upset the apple cart so much for us, mm -hmm. but all my kids, I have, I teach students from kindergarten to grade 12 and most of them are special needs students and pretty much all of them are individualized learners. And so I don't have a grade six class or I don't have a grade five class or I can have my resources cover those outcomes for X number of students. I might have one kid in kindergarten and one kid in grade three and one kid in grade, you know, whatever. And so the reliance on worksheets is I find for myself is a struggle to step away from because I find it difficult to create activities that are going to cover a wider um, span of learning abilities and, and expectations. So um, I guess that's where I'm always trying to think, oh, how can I engage my kids and do collaborative things and do um, stuff like that when everybody's across the board? No, fair enough. But what you're talking about as well, Emily, is, is you've actually got an individualized program and you've got a support already there uh, in terms of parents, whereas this emergency teaching online kind of thing that's happening is that teachers don't have the requisite skills, parents don't have the environment that's already conducive to that, or do they necessarily, did they buy into this? It was tossed on them. So that's where I mean in terms of just pushing content at kids and having assignments done is not necessarily a great solution. I mean, Verena was talking about it with her own son. He was supposed to go to his class and all he did was turn the mic off and the camera and spun around in the chair. I mean, don't blame him. <laughs> I don't see anybody spinning around in chairs and certainly Stephanie's got a spinny chair, but she's not spinning, so that's good. Oh, there, oh, the AT's barber, of course. I, got <laughs> <laughs> I love it. <laughs> so, I don't know. I, 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 don't, I don't think we have solutions. I think we got a lot more questions uh, that are here that, uh, you know, but, but to me, there's a couple of things. And let me just share this with you because and then, I, then we'll close up uh, unless people want to stick around and talk a little bit more. But, but in, when I was looking at things is that it's a picture I found of a, a, a student who's doing the worksheets. And then another one of a student who's out there being creative, just mucking around with stuff. I mean, how do we get from the tension between remote teaching and online learning, which we know, how do we help our colleagues? How do we help schools? How do we, how do we make September actually be more on online learning and less on just pushing content at students? And how do we take the remote of one person to many to online of many for one. So, so many opportunities for each individual in terms of engaging as opposed to one way to do it, tossing it out at many, okay? So, and, and Tony Bates, which uh, I think I flashed around that, that before, is he talks about it's, this is emergency triage and it's not ideal practice. So how do we get to better practice is a struggle. But again, the fourth one to me is really important is, is focus on the social emotional. They are critical, we talked about them in here. It's really important. And what we heard people say is start small, build success, build some experience, okay? Get good, better each day as you try when you go through this. And use what you know works. Use what you're comfortable and then start to stretch out. Don't sit there and say, you all have to use Microsoft Teams and use a SharePoint environment in order to teach kids. Well, unless you've actually experienced it yourself, uh, it's not gonna work. So I would say to all districts, when they have their solutions together that they want in terms of the tools that they want teachers to use, start making teachers the students to teach them how to use those tools 
they get the experience and we get the experience as a student first and then we get to figure out and go play about how we might want to use it ourselves and somehow keep that focus on those competencies that we're talking about the skills keep the focus on creativity don't get into the drill and kill mode because while you might be able to go and do checklists it becomes really really a quick way to kill a lot of this and i know michael you're going to pick up on some of these themes coming up in your your keynote so just if people if you get a chance to stick around for that at noon i think it's important but but take today and make sure you're planning for tomorrow and to me those are sort of the the only concluding things that i've come through from this sort of week experience and reflecting on this particular issue so let me stop sharing and, and uh, open it up for any other last questions before we kind of close this up. Ben? I didn't have a question. I just had a thank you. And okay. um, thank part you. Of, one of the, one of the um, like there's pros and cons you going to the conference for 12 or more years and um, one of the pros of doing this is we did have to actually jump in and try all these different platforms and all these different tools because lots of times I would go to a session and I would hear about it and I would have very good intentions to go out and try it again at home as soon as I got back and then of course I'd get back to the massive amount of emails and whatever else and I would never really try them so um, while I missed some of the face-to-face -face aspects the things that, that we missed that way there were some pros that I didn't expect. Absolutely. And I saw Craig from, from Abbotsford AVS. Uh, he does the virtual reality thing. He actually had everybody in there. And uh, Paul, I think, is Paul still there? Yeah, you, maybe because you, you had an experience with that. And, and to me, that's my takeaway as well, Steph, to, to actually let's go use these tools now next year. Make everybody have this kind of a in-your-face experience so that you actually are in there rather than just watching someone tell you what you can do. And then you walk away and it's like, oh yeah, well, later. <laughs> I don't think Paul's listening to us. So if you get a chance, uh, actually, uh, when we get the recording posted, um, check out Craig Ammon's uh, session. I think it was yesterday. I don't know. This whole week is blurred to me. Anything else? Sorry, I'm listening now. What was your oh. question? Uh, what was the experience with Craig in terms of being in virtual reality? Stephanie was just talking about the fact that we we're thrust into actually using these tools, whereas when we go to the face-to-face -face conference, someone shows us how to do this, and we think, that's great, I want to try that, and then we don't. Yeah, it was super awesome. Um, one, of my, one of my favorite sessions from the conference, actually, was... Um, yeah, just rendering rendering the 3D space in one program, exporting the file, re-uploading it into another space that can actually then export it to VR to a VR headset. So it's uh, I'm gonna have to go back and watch the video because I've got a VR headset. But just from but an ADST you, perspective, super neat to be able to do that with kids. But but you actually did that. He had you doing some of that, right? We were all doing that in real time with him on our multiple screens. It was awesome. Yeah. I, and I actually did something in the Adobe Spark thing that I for sure would have just thought, oh, that looks really cool. I should try it sometime, but then actually was able to make one of the pictures. And now I think, oh, I could actually use that tool. Yeah. We, on, on Monday, we had all the teachers from Catalyst District in. And I think we did the similar thing that I used to get accused of when I had the, my, uh, in the OLTD program that came to 502. I turned people's heads around. They were spinning like crazy. Uh, so, so that was difficult, but I realized the group here that we have now that stayed through, you've had these experiences. So, and, and then it, that push was not as chaotic or, or crippling for you, but it has for, there's one or two individuals who just said, ah, this is too much. I can't cope. I'm out, which is okay. They can come back to the recordings. But of course, we will give them their money back so <laughs> they can spend it elsewhere wisely. Because if you're not learning, just just go. That's fine. Not a problem. Okay, and Mr. Barber, thank you. I, and I apologize to you all about the sort of urgency around that. But it was Brian's uh, 
Carpenter's session on Google Classroom and there's a lot of people that wanted to get in and somehow the wrong link got still was populated, it didn't get refreshed up. So you have a SCED email uh, that came to you while we were through the session that gives the direct link. Hopefully some people got in, but I know that Brian's gonna be in the demo slam. Brian is awesome and it's so great to meet all of you and see the skill sets that are here, the passion, the, the, you know, the, the, the creativity that does come from, from this. I always walk away from these, these events feeling really good about where things are going in the online education field, but also really empowered by some new ideas, some new connection that comes. So one of the things that I'm going to ask you in the evaluation when you get into the main session is how did the networking go? Because one of the reasons that it's so important when we meet at that hotel for all these years and we keep coming back is the networking. It's the same thing that happened to us when we used to go to the iNACL symposiums, when Michael understands this, and that's why we formed this network called Canny Learn, the Canadian E-Learning Network, because we wanted to keep those connections and that networking happening. So how did the networking go this week? How could we make it better? That's, that's the thought that I want to talk to folks about as well. So. I appreciate your time. I appreciate uh, be, you being here. And it is the top of the hour. And I'm going to say, thanks. Go off and do the emails that you've been doing while you've been monitoring this such session. And, uh, and no offense, but it's taking about any of that. So I uh, thanks uh, for being here. And uh, yeah, I look forward to the final session and the demo slam and the prizes. Yay. Okay, thanks, folks. I'm going to close the meeting so it ends the recording. Thanks, Ray.